Hey, thank you so much. Thank you for that. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Welcome to High Ridge. I am so glad that you made it. Let's welcome in all of our friends watching online. What's up, everybody? Good morning to you wherever you are. I'm glad that you are joining in. If you like what you hear today, do us a huge favor. Click the share button on whatever social media platform you're watching this. It always means the world to us when you do that. We're going to grab our Bibles. We're going to turn over to Psalm 91. Excuse me, Psalm 91. <laughs> And as we do that, let me just say thank you for being generous. Thank you for letting your uh, generosity be shown here. You guys are making a difference, not just in Longview, but around the world. I want to share, share with you some pictures of what was happening even this week, because I think it's important that you need to, you need to know where your money's going. When you choose to financially support this institution, you ought to be able to see where your money's going. And so this past week, we were able to host a pastor's gathering for a bunch of local pastors to get together, to begin to pray for one another and to stand the gap for one another. We believe that that spirit of competition between churches needs to be broken. Come on, somebody. In the name of Jesus, we can do a lot more together than we can do separately. And so our brothers are gathering together all over the city, getting to know one another, drawing strength from one another. And we get to be a huge part of that because you are faithful. You are giving here. You are generous. And I love that you're making a difference, not even in this church. That's, that's the, the least of our issues. You're making a difference in other churches. Come on, somebody. That's an awesome thing. I love that. I love that. We also want to say a very special happy birthday to our first lady, my wife. It's her birthday today. Come on, somebody. My birthday will be on Wednesday. I expect cash, no, no less. I'm just kidding. And let me just say thank you for that. Uh, and also, we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, my mom and dad are here. So you guys, keep your mouth shut. Don't you say nothing. They don't need to know all that. No, my well, mom and dad are here. We're so glad to have you, uh, have you here with us today. They normally were worshiping at High Ridge Mineral Wells with Pastor Ryan, but they like me better because I'm blood. Uh, no offense to Pastor Ryan. We also have some of our uh, amazing people that we're connected to in ministry. Bethany, welcome home. We're so glad to have you here. Love you. Welcome back. So I think, yeah, we got the Magnuses back here. Hey, you guys just slipped in on us, so good to see you guys. Jake and Hannah, we love you. Pastor Quest, I see you back there with Miss Lauren and your family. Hello, hello, hello. Good to see you guys. So I love being connected to people that love Jesus. I love seeing what they're doing in their uh, respective ministries all around the world. We love and support each of you guys and are so thankful to have you with us today. So grab your Bibles. Psalm 91 is we're going to spend our time. And as you turn there, as you find it, go ahead and stand to your feet if you wouldn't mind. We are going to declare God's word out together today. We're going to say it with your chest. Come on, say it with your chest. I believe there are some powerful, wonderful, special things that happen when you declare the word of God for yourself. So declare it over your own life today. It's an amazing psalm. It's one of my favorite psalms of all time. So let's declare it out together. Here we go. Come on. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow. Come on. I love it. My God, in whom I trust. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night. Nor the arrow that flies by day. Nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. Nor the plague that destroys those who dwell in A thousand may fall at your side. Ten thousand at your right hand. But it will not come near you. The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling. No harm will overtake you, and no disaster will come near your tent. Come on, somebody. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. Can we, can we get that on the screen? No? I'll tell you what. I'm going to read it for you. <laughs> I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. And honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Give yourselves a big warm round of applause. That's awesome. If nothing else, you're declaring the word of God over your life, over your family, over your business, over your finances. That's what I'm talking about. You may be seated. I love Psalm 91. It is a powerful psalm. Uh, something you may not know is we don't really know who wrote Psalm 91. 
Uh, our best guesses are probably David, but some scholars say it's probably Moses. So either way, somebody in heaven is going to have to owe somebody else some royalty money once we get there because somebody's ro- ripping off somebody. Uh, but this could be one of the oldest songs that we know of, and it's a, it's a powerful one. It speaks of so many amazing things, and it's just something that many of us, at, at, so, at some time in, in your life, you're going to need the words that have, that have so much life in Psalm 91. You need that. We need to remind ourselves to have confidence in the power of God. I love that this thing speaks to so many issues and areas in our life, and it just gives us so much wisdom and power, and it just, it, it just feels good to read it. When it starts talking about all these things you're going to see, but they ain't coming near you, I'm like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. It ain't coming near my house. And here's the thing. I want to I make sure that you know this is a powerful psalm because it's not just powerful for me, and it wasn't just powerful for whoever wrote it between Moses and David. It was powerful for Jesus. If you know your word in Matthew 4 or Luke chapter 4, Jesus himself was, uh, was walking into the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights, and he was just about to start his ministry. And as he's fasting and praying and as he goes into the wilderness, the Bible says that the enemy comes and the devil begins to tempt him, begins to sow these seeds of fear and doubt and discouragement. And in that moment, Jesus responds with Psalm 91. Jesus begins to quote and speak out, just like you did. Jesus begins to speak out the words of this psalm. And I wonder, what happens when you face temptation? What is your response when the enemy comes to you and begins to sow seeds of doubt and fear and discouragement into your life? What's your response? I think it's a sobering question that each of us needs to answer for ourselves. How do I respond to temptation? How do I respond to discouragement? How do I respond when fear is abounding, when I'm getting anxious thoughts, when my anxiety begins to boil up within me? What do I do. I think if we're going to be honest today, many of us would say, whatever I'm doing, it ain't working. Can we be honest? Come on. Whatever I'm doing, it ain't working. Now, sometimes we can, uh, we can say the right phrases and we can say the stuff that we've repeated in church, but here's the, here's the key. When Jesus was faced with that, he quoted Psalm 91. He drew power from this chapter and there's still power for there for you. Here's one thing that I know. If Psalm 91 was good enough to help Jesus, it's good enough for me. Come on, somebody. There's still power there for me. There's still power for you. Whatever your response might be to temptation, let us turn our eyes to the strength that's found in Psalm 91 and remind ourselves to put our confidence back in not my ability to resist, but in God's ability to help me. The Bible says that God gives us a way of escape, and sometimes that way of escape is found by knowing his word. And so my heart and my hope for you is that you would fall deeply and madly in love with the Lord, that you would fall deeply and madly in love with his word, that it would bring itself to life when you need it most. Psalm 91 is a powerful chapter that still speaks wonderful, beautiful, powerful things to us today. So there's power in these psalms. There's great power in these psalms. So I want to give you three things that I think are important as we're digging into God's word. And the first of those, I think, uh, I think you're, you're going to find this to be true. Number one... There is protection, then there's divine protection. Come on, there's protection, then there's divine protection. Now, uh, if you were born here in this country, you understand things a little bit differently than those that were not privileged enough to be born here. We have a beautiful thing in this country, and be it right, wrong, or indifferent, we go through some crazy times. This past week was a crazy debate, like we're just telling the world, hey, y'all just turn away. We're having an inner inner family squabble right now. Please don't judge us by this. It's crazy, this. Come on, somebody. That was just weird. We have some things in America that make us beautiful, some things that we're a little embarrassed of, but by and large, one of the things that makes this country so great is that its people are protected. And we have something that was originally given by our founding fathers called the Bill of Rights, things like our Declaration of Independence. Those things protect the people from government, and that's a beautiful and a good thing. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that it doesn't just change every four years with a new regime. They come in, just wipe all those things away and give you something. No, no, no. Those rights are important. Those things that our country was found upon, founded upon, they, they matter, and they matter still today. I love things like our Bill of Rights. I love our system of government. I love a peaceful transition of power. That's a big thing to me. I like that because other countries don't get that. I love the fact that we have a, gr- a really strong military. That's a big deal to me. Why? Because it keeps my family safe. 
And I'm proud to stand up at a baseball game and, and honor those that have given their lives and, and, and sacrificed for me and for this country. That's a, that's a big deal to me. I think protection is a pretty good thing. And we as Americans are infatuated with our protection. I want my family safe. I want my money safe. Come on, somebody. I want to put it in a banking system that I can know and trust in. Like nobody's just going to run off with it. I want to know that there's some form of safety there for me. So between our military and our Bill of Rights and our alarms and our locks and our glocks, we like protection. <laughs> we like to be kept safe. Come on, somebody. What about divine protection? As infatuated as we are with the things that protect us in the natural realm, what about the things that we don't see? What do you do against the spirits of the age? What do you do when lust and greed what do you do when those things attack you? What do you, what, what do you do with demonic attacks and spiritual warfare? Those things are very real, and they're a very real issue for God's people. So there's protection that we all know and love and appreciate. Then there's divine protection, which we don't think about until we really need it. What is it about divine protection that helps us? What is it that God is offering through Psalm 91? And I think there's a, there's a little bit of a disconnect with what we believe to be true and what God's word says is true about our divine protection. You see, I want to be safe, but I can't be kept safe from everything. And here's, the, here's, here's, an, here's something a little bit deeper, is that God never promises that you're going to have a safe life. And this is where a lot of people's faith will end up becoming shipwrecked, because the moment that we experience anything that's fearful or frightening or failure, we will lose our confidence in God, as if God promised us that we would never walk through a bad day. Let me remind you, you need divine protection because the world is a scary place. You need divine protection because there is a very real spiritual opposition to everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord. You have an enemy. I need divine protection. I need God to watch over me. I need God to watch over my family because I can't see everything from every angle. And I'm not designed and equipped to, to protect my family from everything. I can't. It's too much for me and it's too much for you. So as much as I love protection, I love divine protection because I want to be kept safe. How do I keep myself safe from the things that I can't see, from the things that I can't anticipate, from the things that I don't even understand what's happening around me? How do I do that? I want to remind you of this very simple truth, and I'll put it on the screen so that you can see it. The safest I can ever be is next to my Father and in the center of His will. This is good news for somebody because that's where safety lies. And Psalm 91 echoes that over and over in many different ways, that safety comes from being right up next to the Father, as close as I can be, and doing exactly what he's called me to do. That's safety. I want to remind you that Jesus says, some people build their houses upon the sand, some people build their houses upon the rock, but rain fell on both of them. Some of us are taught to believe that rain never falls on those that God's love. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And if you serve God for more than about five minutes, you realize that sometimes there are things that I don't understand. Why am I walking through this? I love the Lord. I have a great relationship with Jesus, but I still have to walk through hard times. Yes, everybody does. That's why we need divine protection. There's a reason why Jesus says at any moment I could call for 10,000 angels and come, but I, I understand this. I'm supposed to walk through this. There's some things we have to walk through. There's some things that God has uniquely qualified and called you to walk through so that he can show you that he is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. There's protection, then there's divine protection. So who gets that divine protection? Who are those that, that get watched over? And I, I'd love to say that God watches over every single person in the, in, in the history of the world. God has watched over all of us. But scripture doesn't really say that. Scripture says, and I'm going to give you a secret, God has favorites. There are some people that God's like, I'm watching over these. Why? Because they love me, and they respect me, and they have a great relationship with me. And some people choose out of their own free will to say, Lord, I don't need you. I can protect myself. Let, let that not be us. Let me show you this in Psalm 34. David says, the angel of the Lord encamps around about those that fear him. And those are the people that God delivers. So it would be really critical for us as believers to take a good look at the fear of the Lord and what does it look like in my life? What does it mean to fear God? Does that mean I'm just afraid of him? Is that what that means? 
I want you to know this, that depending upon your relationship with the Lord, that word fear means two different things. You see, to unbelievers, fearing God means they should be afraid of his judgment because look at me, it's coming. It's coming. But to believers, it means that we have a deep love and reverence for him. I wonder if you look at your love for the Lord and your deep respect and your reverence for him, how does that really play, play out practically in your life? How would you know for sure that I have a deep love and reverence and respect for the Lord more than just lip service, more than just saying, yeah, I agree with that, that's a good thing. We have a deep love and reverence and respect for the Lord. How do you know? Because if God is saying in, in, in Psalm 34, and he is, that my angel's gonna, gonna camp around you and I'm gonna deliver you, I'm gonna protect you, I'm going to give you that divine protection for those that fear the Lord, then it's pretty important that we look at our lives and say, do I really fear the Lord? Or is that something that I'm missing out on? Have I forfeited divine protection because I simply don't honor and respect the Lord like I think I do? That's important for us to look at. You see, if we look at it in the natural, uh, that protection part, there are uh, great ways that we will demonstrate our respect. And some of us just do it without even thinking about it. If we're at a ball game and someone comes out and says, please stand for the singing of our national anthem, everybody stands up. And if you don't stand, you're going to hear something about it. Because this is America, baby. Back-to-back World War champs. Get some. <laughs> Land of the free, home of the whopper. And we stand for the flag. And we salute it. And you're going to start saying things from memory. You're going to start quoting the Pledge of Allegiance. If someone begins to play the Star Spangled Banner, you're going to sing along. You can even sing the high notes. Why? Because it's America. It's what we do. When the color guard walks out there and they, and they put that flag out there, people will stand. Some people may even start crying. Oh, that's beautiful. And jets fly over and they have the smoke coming behind them. Like, yeah, America. <laughs> it's easy for us to respect the things that protect us. But yet when it comes to the respect and showing honor and great reverence for the things of the Lord, how do we do that? What is the equivalent of standing, putting my hand over my heart? What is the equivalent of singing out the national anthem or singing out the declarations of how good he is in comparison to the things that protect me as a citizen? What about my citizenship that's in heaven? How do I demonstrate my respect and reverence for God? And this is where many believers fall incredibly short. This is where it goes from lip service and just a thought to actually doing it. Let me show you it this way. This may be the most important thing that I say, and so I want to make sure that you see this. Reverence for God is demonstrated by our willingness to die to self and follow his leading in how we should live. How do I know I have a deep reverence for God? How has it changed your life? How does it impact your ability to say, no, that's not me anymore? I choose to say no. Why? Because I love him more than I love that. I love Jesus more than I want that. I love Jesus more than I'm attracted to that. When we demonstrate our great love and fear and respect for the Lord, it comes out in practical ways of dying to ourself, dying to our flesh and saying, I can't do that. Not because I'm better than you, but because I love him and I appreciate what he's done for me. Reverence for God should have some practical outlets in the lives of believers but unfortunately, many people will say, I, I said a prayer, I accepted the Lord into my heart, but I'm never going to change my life because I want God to just love me and save me and protect me from all harm, but I don't ever want to have to change the way that I live. There's a process that believers walk through. It's called sanctification, and it still matters. That doesn't mean that you're not saved. It means you're not submitted. And he wants to be, he wants to be Lord of all, not Lord of most. There's still power in the Psalms to tell us things like there's a big difference between protection and and divine protection. Here's the second thing I want to share with you. Number two, it makes it clear in Psalm 91 that I will face frightening things, but I don't have to be afraid. And there's a, a big difference between face, facing frightening things and doing them with fear. Fear makes the experience exponentially worse. Now, that doesn't mean that you're never going to walk through bad days. You will. I think there's a, there's a crazy belief in Christianity today that's saying as children of God, you'll never have to walk through a bad day. Whatever. Keep living. Live for longer than five minutes. You're going to face some frightening things. Please hear me. That doesn't mean God's not good. 
what we discovered as we're looking back, you know, hindsight is 2020, that's what they say. And as you're looking at 2020 with some hindsight, there's some things that we see on the other side of 2020 that we didn't see as we were walking into it. And the things that we were walking into in 2019 in the beginning of 2020 leading up to around Easter was fear came in and gripped not just our world, it gripped the church. And there's not a single person that can say, I was never afraid for a minute. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. We all were. Why? Because it was scary. We didn't know. COVID plus fear equals global pandemic and markets shutting down. People freaking out and not knowing how to, how to handle this. But as you look back four years later, COVID without fear, you're like, I'm going to call in sick. I get a couple days off. I can tell people stay away from me, and it's good. Some of you are like, I'm built for this. I've had COVID for four years straight. <laughs> like, you, you're probably not well. <laughs> but you add fear to it, and it takes it from being a nuisance to a global pandemic. You see the difference? You're going to face frightening things. We're, we're not immune to everything as believers. And this is important for us to get it at the base core of our theology. Uh, let me say it this way. I'm not immune to everything, but I'm loved and cared for in all things. So let's not get this twisted that this Psalm 91 is a promise to every believer that you'll never get sick and you'll never die. That's not true. Of course you will. Some of you, I'm going to have to preach your funeral. And I, out of service to you, I will lie. And I will tell people how amazing you were. He would give you the shirt off his back. No, you wouldn't. But I will say that. For you. Just for you. No, no, no. This... this Psalm 91 is not a promise that you're never going to have to walk through this stuff. It's a reminder that God is in the habit of delivering people, and he does it all the time. God does amazing things all the time. And there are times where it makes no sense, and God's like, yeah, that's not for you. Everybody else, but not for you. Why? Because I have a great relationship with you, and I love you. I'm protecting you from that. God does that all the time. And there is not a believer, I believe. If you've been following God for longer than about five minutes, you've seen this to be true. You know it. Like, so I'm not saying these things will never happen to me, but I'm saying God is a good God, and there are times where he does amazing things. I don't get to choose when he does and when he doesn't do that. My responsibility is simply to love him. I'm not going to be in denying of reality. And somewhere along the line, we get into that where we believe that walking by faith means I can deny reality. That's not what that, that, that's not what that means. Let me just tell you, if you have a broken arm and your doctor says, let's look at this extra. Yeah, look at that. There's a broken arm. You can't say, I don't receive that. Like, come on, like, it's a cast, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Now, there are some things you shouldn't be speaking over yourself. Don't speak in, don't speak in fear, speak in faith. But walking by faith, please hear me, I'm going to show you on the screen. Walking by faith isn't denying reality. It's drawing comfort from the fact that God is with me no matter what. He's with me. His Bible says his rod and staff that comfort me. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with me. That's what faith is. He's with me. That if he's with me, he'll walk me through anything. Anything. There's still power in the Psalms. Come on, somebody. There's still power there. So it's not denying reality. It's saying, hey, God's with me in spite of what I see. In spite of what I'm having to walk through, he's still with me. And I believe he's still good. And he is in the habit of delivering people just like me from situations just like this and does it all the time. My confidence is in him. Are you going to face frightening things? Look at me. Yes, you will. But God is still good, and I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to add fear to it. Here's the third and final things I want to share with you from Psalm 91. Number three, loving the Lord is the key to my deliverance. Loving the Lord is the key to my deliverance. It's not just in what you say and just decreeing something constantly. No, no, no. It's more than that. Why? Because love is more than that. Love is more than words. Love shows action. Love communicates trust. Loving the Lord is the key to my deliverance. How do we know that? Because the, the writer here says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. That's a big key, isn't it? Because he loves me, I will rescue him. I will deliver him. Now, if you want to take anything as a promise, take that as a promise. Not that you'll never need deliverance. You will. And more than just deliverance from our sin, 
You're going to need deliverance from bad days. Deliverance from the attacks of the evil one. But God says, but you just worry about loving me, and I'll help you. I will rescue you. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. So how do I protect myself from all these things that I can't see and from this issue and from that issue? How do I protect myself from this and how do I protect myself from that? How do I stand in faith with all these things? Let me just remind you, you can't protect yourself from everything. God is our divine protector. And he sees the end from the beginning. He's the alpha and the omega. He sees all the ins and all the outs. It's his job to know, not mine. It's his job to fight this battle. It's not always my job. According to this scripture, here's what we know. My job isn't to protect myself from all harm. My part is to love Jesus. That's what I'm responsible for. What does that tell me as a believer? It tells me that I must nurture and protect my love for him at all costs. The most important thing in my life is that I just love him and have a great relationship with him where I can hear from him every single day where I'm drawing strength and drawing courage from his word. That's important. If anything else is lost, let it not be that, my love for the Lord. Why? Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. You want deliverance from trouble? You worry about your relationship with the Lord. Lord, I'm in trouble, but I know I love you, and I know that you'll love me. So from the beginning of time, you have seen the attack of the evil one on people like Adam and Grandma Eve to get them to doubt the word of God and God's love for them, to separate them in that relationship with the Lord. You see this happening in the life of Christ as he's walking into this wilderness. The enemy wants to get him to doubt, to falter, to be discouraged, to be afraid, to choose another way around suffering. But Jesus walks through it. He said, this is the reason why I came, not to live a life without suffering. It's not possible. The Bible says Jesus was in all ways tempted just as you and I were. So that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. So he can say, I love the Lord and he loves me. And if you love the Lord, you know he loves you. He will deliver you just like he delivered me. Psalm 91 is a great reminder of this amazing truth. And I want to make sure that you see this. Look at this on the screen. Life will try to shake your love for God because it can never shake God's love for you. Isn't that good? It will never shake God's love for me. So here's the question. How's your love for the Lord? This is what I found to be true, that there are seasons in my life where I can say my love for him was never stronger. And there are also seasons in my life where I'm like, eh, I really love me. Like Terrell Owens says, I love me some me, right? Get your popcorn ready. I love me some me. How's your love for the Lord in this season? Can we just Take an honest evaluation of your own heart today. If it's so critical that our love for the Lord be nurtured and protected at all costs, if our very deliverance and our ability to be walked through any trial depends upon our love for the Lord, and by the way, we know we can't change his love for us, so it's our response to him, our ability to stay close to him, to listen to him, to be guided and kept in any situation. If that's so critical... And I need to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit. I need to be able to draw truth from his word. I need to be able to hear his guidance. And when he says, go left, I go left. When he says, go right, I go right. If all of that is critical and hinges upon my love for the Lord, then it's important that I ask myself that question. How is my love for the Lord today? And how would I demonstrate that? How would I nurture that? How would I give myself a good self-evaluation and say, Lord, I know that you love me. And I know for sure that I love you. And I demonstrate that by listening to you, by starting my day and ending my day with you, by worshiping you, by spending time in prayer, by reading your word and allowing your word to speak into my life, by dying to myself, by saying, Lord, I know that that's not right. I'm not going to do that anymore. Will you please forgive me for that? Give me some strength so I don't have to go back to that place ever again. Help me to make some better decisions today. That's how I demonstrate my practical love for the Lord. How's your love for the Lord in this season? Would you say that you're closer to the Lord than you've ever been? Has he been walking you through this? Has he been helping you? I promise you this, he loves you. The Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us in this way, that while we were still sinners, 
he sent Christ to die for us. Jesus says we love because he first loved us. So God has proven his love on the front end. And I believe that we can prove our love to him on our end by taking a good, honest look at our lives and saying, Lord, I'm, I want to be more in love with you than I've ever been. What's the next level for me and you? You know, love has to be more than just words. I believe that your praise is important. We talked about that last week and letting the fruit of your lips, Lord, you know, declare his praises. I also believe that repentance is an important part of our love for the Lord, saying, I'm sorry. But more than words, our actions need to match the posture of our heart. A dying to ourself and our willingness to live a life according to what he wants for us, not just what we want in order to stay more comfortable. Can you receive that, everybody? As we finish up today, I'm going to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes. And we're going to say a three-word prayer that has been a powerful prayer for the church for centuries. There's a prayer that we know from the history of the church, from the catacombs and the, and the martyrs and all the things that Christians have had to walk through. There's a prayer that has lasted throughout time that we still pray today. And the prayer is this, Holy Spirit, come. Those three words, Holy Spirit, come. I want to invite you, if you wouldn't mind, to pray that prayer with me right now, right where you are. Would you just open up your hands and maybe place them on your, on your legs as if you're, someone was handing you something in this moment. Just open up yourself to receive from the Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Father, I want to be closer to you than I've ever been. I want to have a deep love for you. I want to yearn for you. Lord, it's easy for my life to get full of distractions and to be full of things that simply don't matter. It's easy for me to get sidetracked on all these side missions and forget about my love for you being the most important thing. Lord, let it all come back to a simple love for you. Lord, I know that you love me. We know that you love us. Father, help us to know that we love you. Help us to demonstrate that practically every day by living according to your word, by honoring you with the fruit of our lips and with our actions matching what we're saying. Let the posture of our hearts always be towards loving you out of a deep honor and respect for who you are and what you've done. You're an amazing God. You're a divine protector. Let us always live underneath the shadow of your wings. Lord, let our children Live underneath your protection. Come on, somebody, say amen. Let our grandchildren live underneath your protection, Father. We want your divine protection over our loved ones, Lord. Lord, we need protection over our finances and over our future. Father, our country needs protection more than a military, more than a bill of rights. Lord, we need you, our divine protector. Lord, you have guided us and you have sustained us through so much. Please help us, Lord. We cry out to you. We remind ourselves that you love us, Lord. And we declare today with one voice, we love you. So Holy Spirit, come. Help us to love you more. And now with heads bowed and eyes closed, perhaps you're here today, my friend, and you're saying, Pastor, if I'm going to be honest with you, I don't have this whole God thing worked out. I don't have a relationship with the Lord like some of these people might have. I, I may have been raised in church, but I've gotten away from God and I need that relationship with the Lord. My friend, if that's you, I believe if you could see it right now, God himself is reaching down his hand to you, hoping that you'll respond. And if you want a relationship with the Lord, let me tell you, it's just a prayer way. You may say, well, what do I pray? How do I do that? Let me help you the same way somebody helped me one time. If you want a relationship with Jesus, then repeat after me. You can say it out loud. You can say it with a whisper. It's not important that you do it out loud or not. The most important thing is that you believe it, that you say it in faith. But pray this prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that you came and died and rose again. I believe that you did that so that I could have life, abundant life. You did that so that I could have forgiveness for all of my sins, for all that I've done wrong. So Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I've made a mess of my life. But I surrender to you and ask you to save me. 
please forgive me of my sins. Wash me. Fill me with your spirit. I'm all yours. I give my life to you in Jesus' name. And now with heads bowed and eyes closed all across this place, just those of you who prayed that prayer, if that was you, would you look up at me and slip up your hand and say, that was me, I did, I prayed that prayer. Yes, ma'am, I see you. Yes, good for you. Yes, ma'am, I see you. Good for you, good for you. Yes, sir. I'm so proud of you and those that just made that decision. Good for you. For those of you that prayed that prayer with me, I want you to know that there is a, a phone number appearing behind me on the screen. That number is for you to text. Text the words, I prayed to that number. And what I'm gonna do is send you back some things that will help you understand what just happened inside of your heart and what you're supposed to do next. It's the greatest honor of my life to help people meet Jesus and have a great, healthy walk and respect and love for him on a daily basis. Let me help you with that. So it's a, it's a free number. It's a free gift. That's my hope for you. Good for you. For everybody else, go ahead and look up at me if you would, then let's stand to our feet together. I'm going to invite our elders and their wives to step forward. They're going to be right here at the front of this platform to be available to pray for you about anything that you might need prayer for. Once again, if you're watching online and you enjoyed what you, what you heard here today, um, or if you have social media, do us a huge favor. Click the share button. You guys are making an amazing difference. There's between two and 3,000 people watching this message every single week all around the world, and we are continually shocked and blown away by what God's people can do when they stand behind us with their finances and by sharing with, with us their social media. So thank you for that. You guys are making a huge difference. People are coming to know Jesus that will never step foot in this church. And that's a really, really cool and powerful thing. I love that. We're redeeming technology. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs to do it. I love that. For everybody else, let me pray for you and bless you as you go. Father, I pray that you'd bless my friends with an incredible week, following after your heart, loving on you every single day. Lord, we ask for your divine protection. I ask that you would watch over and bless my friends as they go. In Jesus' name, and all of us said together, Amen. God bless you as you go. Have an amazing week.